this is um, a range of um, colleagues. We've got 800 people, uh, colleagues in this building. This is the <coughs> committed group of um, colleagues. Oh, and we've got 27 uh, colleagues online. So a fantastic turnout. Uh, and this is so we've, we've, we had a whole week of Festival of Feminism events uh, within the same UK to support International Women's uh, Day, which was yesterday. And um, you're the last lunchtime talk, but we also have a film this afternoon, which we were just talking about. Um, the film is called Misrepresentation, and it looks at female body, images. sexuality, image of women. Image, image of women. Um, so, um, are you ready? Yes. So, I was just going to give a very quick intro sure. to um, London, East um, London Black Women's Project. Um, London Black Women's Project is an organisation very dear to my heart. I've been involved in it from its very beginning. Um, it was established in 1987. Um, um, its first um, resource was a, a refuge for um, women of uh, South Asian background. Um, it was the, um, at that time, there was um, evidence that a lot of uh, particularly Asian women and um, African Caribbean women, their needs were not being met by uh, mainstream uh, white women's refugees. There was a, a lot of uh, racism that women were experiencing, and and for many, their cultural, dietary, um, religious needs were not being catered for. And, and so in the early 80s, there was a, a strong movement by uh, black and, and minority ethnic women to set up specialist services that met the specific needs of, of BME, uh, women from BME communities. And um, the, the first refuge was for, for Asian, Asian South Asian women were open, was opened in uh, Lambeth, um, I think in 1982. And um, London Black Women's uh, the, the refuge in Newham, which, which um, is part of um, Black Women's Project now, opened in 1987. Um, and over the course of 30 years, it's just expanded to become one of the, the, the leading um, uh, organizations working with black and white minority ethnic and refugee communities. Um, it provides a whole range of services, which I'm sure Ajit will talk about. Um, so um, thanks everybody for coming, and thanks Ajit for coming and talking to us about the work of a really important grassroots women's organization. Thank you, Gulshan. Can everyone hear me? Sure. Uh, I've got a little bit of a cold, so just let me know if my voice falls in it. Um, just to check in terms of time, how much time have we got? About an hour. About an hour, OK. Then what I'll do is I'll go over a little bit of the history of the formation of the organization, and then I'll get into where we are present day, the kinds of services that we delivered, that we deliver and how we've evolved uh, over the past three decades. Uh, this year is an anniversary year for us, so it's 30 years of operation, um, and uh, it's quite significant because um, it's been uh, 30 years of significant struggle, trying to get funding, trying to get voices heard, trying to get representation uh, for black minority ethnic and refugee women. Um, so it's quite a landmark year in terms of our history. Um, so just to pick up uh, from where Gulshan um, left, which, is, uh, which was the introduction to the organization. I've been with the organization for 10 years, so I started um, in 2007. Um, and we have services and projects operating in East London, so we cover uh, Newham, Tower Hamlet, Redbridge, Barking and Dagenham. We've also got refuges in Haringey in North London. Um, we provide services to about 1,200 BME women and girls uh, or annually, um, and that starts uh, from age 8 all the way up. Um, we also provide services to children in the domestic violence refuges, and we've got uh, uh, seven 
domestic violence refuges, uh, which equates to about 51 bed spaces uh, for BME women in London. Uh, in terms of our staffing, we've got 22 staff uh, which work across the organization in the refuges and um, at our uh, main center on Barking Road in Newham. Um, some of the other services that we have, we've got a free legal advice and information service to BME women, um, and that covers human rights, welfare rights, housing, and domestic violence. Um, we've also got counseling and therapeutic support services for women children of all ages, um, early intervention and prevention services, which I'm going to actually talk to you about uh, in more depth um, towards the end of the presentation, um, which is the work that we do in schools and colleges with young women and girls up to the age of 21, um, where we focus specifically on violence against women and girls. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll have a discussion with you about the forms of violence that we're seeing uh, from uh, the work that we do in the schools and colleges. Um, so that's a, a very brief overview of London Black Women's Project. The only other fact that you should know is that in March last year, we officially changed our name to London Black Women's Project. Before then, we were called New Asian Women's Project. Um, also, I'm happy to take questions throughout. So if I'm talking about something and you've got questions, I'm happy to, to take questions. Okay, so okay, so just a little bit about our history, uh, back to the future. Um, in 1981, um, there was a collective uh, of women that was called uh, New Asian Women's Collective. Um, and New Asian Women's Collective was the collective that um, actually started to look at the needs of South Asian women in, in New Room. Um, so they were looking at um, the fact that uh, lots of South Asian women were not coming, uh, coming to access services. Uh, there was significant need among South Asian women, especially uh, need to address domestic violence. And this collective wanted to know, well, if there was tremendous need in the community, why weren't they coming forward to access services? Um, so they began to talk to women in the community and they discovered that there were a number of barriers that uh, were preventing South Asian women from accessing services. Discrimination, racism being um, uh, high up on the list of, of the barriers that, that women experienced. Um, other barriers did include language, um, as well as uh, professionals not being able to appropriately understand the needs of South Asian women. So the collective became quite concerned with this problem and started to look at how to develop a service framework so that women could um, access services that they very much needed. Um, uh, in 1982, uh, just through the early activism work, um, we had East London Asian Women's Group being formed. And East London Asian Women's Group was operating in London boroughs of Redbridge, Birkin and Dagenham, uh, Walton Forest, and uh, uh, also the Canning Town area of, of Newham. Um, two of the areas that I mentioned, Birkin and Dagenham and Canning Town, are important to highlight because they were also a hotbed of activity for the National Front at the time. So we're talking about 1982, there is a lot of um, racial tension in East London communities and uh, National Front is also operating in two of the, community, in, um, two of the areas, uh, so Barking and Dagenham and Canning Town. So the early um, feminists, the early activists um, were not just looking at gender oppression and gender violence, but were also concerned with uh, racial discrimination and the racism that um, that they saw being organized in the communities by the National Front. 
Um, so the work continued throughout the 1980s, um, and the other fact that you have to bear in mind is that the Thatcher government was actually in power in 1979, um, and that created a lot of tension within communities as well. So 1987, uh, New Mission Women's Project is born, uh, and it um, focuses its activities in terms of emergency domestic violence refuge provision. Um, and uh, opened up uh, uh, one refuge with seven bed spaces in 1987, but also within the refuge, um, we had all of our office facilities, um, so the staff were located in the refuge, um, the outreach workers were located in the refuge, and uh, our finance and HR functions. Um, that's not the way it is today, um, but at the time, because of the resources that we had, that was the way that, that, that um, we could um, continue to uh, serve the community as an organization. So we had to really concentrate our resources um, and just operate everything from the, the refuge. Um, so 2015, last year, we changed our name to London Black Women's Project. Okay, I just want to look at um, just want to look at some of the historical context for the work. Um, so, 1960s in the new area, um, you had a massive uh, decline um, in terms of the economy. Um, which produced in the decades to come, and um, by 1979, you had 45% job loss. So you had really high unemployment rates of the new population, um, and uh, and you didn't have new industries taking up um, the uh, the industrial sector that was disappearing. Um, in 1975, you also we also had uh, Councillor Bill Watts. Um, who said that um, uh, that Newham Council was tampering with housing policies to control the flow of Asian and African Afro Caribbean communities into Newham? So they were um, manipulating and uh, trying to control the flow of migrant populations into the area by. Uh, by looking at the housing policies and by working very differently with housing policies when it came to these communities. Um, so 1981 population, 27% of residents were born um, into household, uh, households that were headed by Afro-Caribbean and Asian um, communities. Um, and in the 1970s, we talked about already about uh, racial attacks on the communities, um, uh, and very vicious, actually, very vicious and very violent racial attacks on communities. Um, so I just offered you a little bit of information about, or a few examples about how the racial attacks occurred. So for example, there was in 1972 where a young sick boy was threatened if he didn't take off his turban and cut his hair. Um, and there were other incidents as well. Um, so, um, next slide. Um, okay, the Ministry of Education. Um, so we talked about housing and how housing policy was uh, used to control the flow of migration, but education policy was also used. Um, so for example, in no known school, um, could the population of children exceed 30% from migrant communities? So they had to be dispersed uh, across the main schools regardless of the area in which they lived. Um, so there was um, quite a bit of um, control of populations in Newham using social policies like housing and education. Um, the murder in 1980 of um, Akhtar Ali um, also generated widespread community protest. Uh, and again, it was another racially motivated murder. Uh, and then September 1982, you had the new mate. Um, this is a very famous uh, case which really galvanized uh, the community in Newham. 
Um, and basically it was um, uh, a group of young men who were arrested um, when they were defending younger children who were victims of racial attacks in the schools. And then um, they um, were taken to Forest Gate Police Station um, where they were uh, beaten um, at the hands of the police. And this really galvanized the community and, and there were um, protests in the street to address the racial oppression that communities were facing in Europe. Um, so these, um, I highlight these events for a very important reason. Um, as a, a women's organization, as a black women's organization, we come from a place in history, and history is very important to us. So it isn't just about emerging and, um, and delivering services, but it is about um, how we see oppression within society much more broadly. Um, and, um, and, and it is important to recognize um, where we come from because it helps us to define um, how we deliver our services, um, how we mobilize today, um, and the importance that history plays in terms of our identity as an organization. The questions that we were asking back then are still relevant today, perhaps slightly differently, but they are still relevant today. We still have a housing um, problem in, uh, in Noam, um, and we still have various other social problems, and we also have very high rates of unemployment, and we see gendered patterns in the rates of unemployment. So there is some, um, there is um, quite a bit of importance that our organization places on um, the history, uh, the early history of, um, of the emergence of, of, of the organization and, and the issues that we were dealing with uh, back in the 1970s, 1960s, 1980s. Okay, um, this is Noam present day. So BME population uh, represents 56% of the overall Noam population. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, grading, social grading between male and females, 23% of women compared to 19% of men are, are on state benefit. Um, and uh, the difference in terms of the economically active population and the economically inactive population is 18%, so 59%, 41% respectively. Uh, one third of the population is economically in inactive, and um, this uh, women represent 50% of this, this figure. Um, so in terms of um, the past three decades, um, there has been a uh, uh, increase in some of the social and economic indices in terms of poverty, disadvantage, and uh, conditions of employment. Um, it's important, uh, again, uh, to highlight this because the questions that we're facing today as London Black Women's Project um, are, um, do we need refuge provision anyway? Um, so, is there a future for refuge provision? Um, is that need still um, evident today? Um, and that's a very vital and critical question uh, in terms of um, uh, not just you know, but um, nationally is an important question. Um, another question is, well, if we need refuges, do we need BME specialist women's refuges? Uh, why not just have generic refuges? Because it's a lot cheaper to, um, or it's perceived to be a lot cheaper to service the whole of the population without having the BME specialist criteria um, in, in the provision. Um, and another question is, okay, this came up after Brexit. Um, we had a visitor after Brexit, the Brexit vote, um, and she knocked on our door and she wanted to know why we have black in our uh, title. So she wanted to know why we call ourselves London Black Women's Project and she said that, well, I don't go to Africa and set up uh, white women's organizations. So why do you come here and set up black women's organizations? Um, so that was quite, quite an interesting question. Um, but um, 
And that was just shortly after the Brexit vote. So the Brexit vote was announced that morning, and then we had the visitor um, uh, just before lunchtime. We later realized that um, that something was happening in Newham, and um, another episode happened where one of our refuge residents, um, she was from uh, 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 Somalian origin, she uh, was just returning to the refuge after shopping, and she was viciously attacked um, just outside the refuge. Um, and. Um, and she had only moved into the refuge about three weeks prior to being attacked. Um, we started to report these incidents to the police, obviously, um, and we were told um, that we should expect these incidents and that they will die down, that people just feel that now, since the boat's taken place, that they can say things that previously they weren't able to say. So there's kind of normalization of the fact that these incidents were happening. Um, we don't feel it should be normalized um, because these are very serious incidents and we don't feel that it should be normalized. Uh, so we started to monitor racial incidents. Um, back in the day, in the 1980s, there was a project that was set up that was called the Neural Monitoring Project and it was set up precisely to monitor racial incidents and also to mobilize um, for justice for those who were victimized by racism. Uh, that project doesn't exist anymore, sorry, I'm not very good with the mic. <laughs> that project doesn't exist anymore, um, so we couldn't turn to no monitoring project because they lost their funding about a year ago, or two years ago. Um, so we just started doing it internally. So we started to monitor the racial incidents. And we started to collect um, lots of accounts um, from staff, from our management committee, from staff. We also started to see that the number of women who were accessing our services declined for about three to four weeks. And the reason was that they were staying home because they were too fearful to leave their homes. Um, it's important to highlight because it's the context in which we operate. We face these issues every day. Um, so we're not just dealing with domestic violence, but we're dealing with a whole series of, of issues. Um, and the reason I highlight it is that um, we are a project that addresses uh, multiple intersectional needs. So we address all forms of oppression. Gender oppression is one of them, but also race, class, um, sexuality, oppression that's, uh, that uh, occurs because of a person's sexual orientation. So, you know, we, we face all of these oppressions. Women don't come to us and choose which oppression they're going to deal with today. They deal with everything because it is the context of their life. Um, and this has never gone away. It's always been a part of the way that we, that we develop our services, the way that we um, deliver our work, um, and the kind of support that women expect from us. Okay. Um, I thought I would uh, go down to um, a slide that says vital statistics. Uh, you'll have to scroll through these quickly. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so, um, so I've outlined sort of the more global context for our work. Um, so I thought in the remaining time that I've got, I'd just focus on the specific elements of the work that we, that we deliver. Um, so uh, from our casework, this is from last financial year, um, but it's consistent with, um, with, uh, with uh, the previous five years of our work. Um, we've got, um, just in terms of all of the services, so from the services to young women and girls all the way up to adult women services, um, we have 88% of domestic violence um, victims, survivors who experience more than one form of, of domestic violence. 
um, and it covers sexual harassment, stalking behavior, um, all of the other parts of the definition that fall into the national definition of domestic violence, coercive control and controlling behavior. In eight to 10 cases, high risk cases, um, abuse escalates in frequency or severity or both. Okay. Uh, in 42% of domestic violence, um, victims um, are victimized more than once. Um, so I'll talk about that in terms of a number of different examples. So for example, there is multiple perpetrator abuse um, and also prolonged periods of abuse um, that uh, occur in various stages of a woman, of a young woman and, girl, and a woman's life. 80% um, of high-risk victims from our caseload experience physical forms of domestic violence. 90% experience emotional abuse, uh, verbal abuse, um, controlling behaviors. And 79% of young women experience domestic violence uh, in their relationship, which is a very high number. Um, but one of the things that you have to remember is that we're a domestic violence organization, so that's what we do day in, day out. So we uh, support um, victim survivors of domestic violence. So 79% of the young women who access our services, and that's um, uh, from a figure of 500 a year, uh, experience uh, domestic violence in their relationship. Um, and 19% experience sexual abuse. These are the figures for the Young Women and Girls Project. So I said that they're developed under early intervention and prevention framework, and we support young women from ages 18 to 21. So in terms of the cases that I looked at, um, I looked at 211 cases um, last financial year, and these are the figures that, um, that, uh, that came from those cases. Um, so physical abuse, 66%, coercive control, 5%, I'm just looking at a few of these, uh, sexual um, abuse, 41%, forced marriage cases, 44%, not of actual forced marriage occurring, but the risk of forced marriage um, perhaps uh, happening um, at some point in the life of the young woman. Um, so just looking at these cases and knowing that we're an organization that's set up to support um, uh, domestic violence, um, the numbers are still pretty horrendous um, in terms of young women and girls experiencing violence and abuse. So we are looking at really high uh, figures of domestic and sexual violence for young women and girls. What's the catchment area of these referrals? Um, okay, so it's different for different services. Um, for the work that we do with young women and girls, uh, it is all of the schools and colleges in Newham. So that is a pretty much localized service because of the way the funding structure is. Um, we do often get referrals from Tower Hamlets, which is a neighboring East London borough, and from Redbridge for some of our projects. Um, but for the majority of these cases, it's new for young women and girls. Any other questions? Well, I have a question. I was yeah. wondering what's the criteria for um, high risk cases? Okay. Um, we use an, uh, uh, an assessment um, which is called Safe Lives Dash Risk Assessment. Um, and we've adopted that for, uh, sorry, let me just go back. The Safe Lives Dash Risk Assessment is the one that's, that we're required to use as refuge providers. So for women who access our refuges, we use that assessment to assess um, whether a woman is high, medium, low, et cetera, um, on, the, on the risk uh, categories. We've adopted that assessment to also cover young women and girls services so that we've got some form of consistency across the board in assessing risk. Um, and um, so on that assessment, some of the categories that would um, define someone as high risk would be um, perpetrator violence, um, the, um, whether or not a perpetrator is actively seeking out a woman, um, uh, and whether the woman
woman has been followed, um, the severity of the abuse that she suffered, um, her social networks, whether she has access to social networks, um, the degree of safety, so does she have safe space if she's not in a refuge, um, is where she is presently living safe, um, and then history of abuse and violence within the family, so if, for example, there's been forced marriage or FGM, then her risk is higher that she would be also victimized by forced marriage and FGM. Um, so we've adapted it to cover young women and girls, and, um, and um, so based on a very comprehensive assessment of about 50 to 60 categories, we're able to um, identify a risk score, and then that tells us the degree of risk that, that she's facing. Okay. Um, okay, just in terms of forced marriage, um, so again, last financial year, 92 cases of forced marriage risk, um, 35 cases where there was some form of ceremony um, or some sort of formal arrangement having taken place. In 10 cases, there was family discussion about the forced marriage taking place, which caused fear for or concern for the young woman. Uh, in 23 cases, travel plans had been made. Um, and in 19 cases, uh, a young woman was reporting a, a concern, but um, there wasn't information about exactly uh, how far the family had taken the arrangement. Um, and then in five cases, a family member had uh, had a forced marriage, um, so that would then uh, create a risk for, for her. Um, there were no cases of early marriage, um, but um, we did have cases of young women and girls presenting um, aged 18 and under. So there, wasn't, there weren't any cases of early marriage, but young women and girls under the age of 18 were reporting a concern about forced marriage. Um, yeah, um, some of the other things I just want to say about forced marriage is um, in most of those cases we had extended family and community intervention in the forced marriage, so it wasn't just the family, but there were extended family and community involved. Um, there was also risk of multiple perpetrator um, abuse in the forced marriage. Um, and also, uh, overwhelming number of the cases of forced marriage did not want, um, uh, yeah, did not want to disclose too much about the forced marriage because under the Forced Marriage Act, um, the criminal penalty for anyone, any adult, engaging in forced marriage is seven years or yeah, seven years imprisonment. Um, so because of that, um, a lot of young women do not come forward and disclose um, their concerns around forced marriage. The usual way that we hear about a concern is when the friend of the woman comes to us and says, um, I'm concerned for my friend. Um, so it's reported indirectly in that manner. The other thing, I just have one, and, uh, one um, example to give you here, is there is a tremendous gap in supporting young women and girls aged 16 and 17. We had a case of a forced marriage. Um, the young woman was terrified um, that her father would take her out of the country um, and that she would be forced into a marriage. Um, we did all of our assessments, contacted social services. Um, social services did a home visit, um, and during the home visit, uh, the social worker had tea with the father, and they had a very pleasant conversation. And then the social worker uh, returned to her office and determined that, well, the father is such a nice guy that it's not possible that he could or would force his, force his daughter into marriage. Um, so you get all kinds of strange responses um, to violence against women and girls, especially for the 16 to 17 year old group. We had another case um, which actually fit 
a lot of what's on the screen now. Um, a case of multiple perpetrator abuse, where she was groomed from a very early age, um, and it was um, initially by an uncle. Um, she was then sexually abused and raped by friends of the uncle, uh, exploit, exploited, sexually exploited for about five years of her life. She then uh, heard about our services. She joined a support group. Um, and then it was in the support group where one of the topics that they were talking about was sexual abuse. She uh, approached the, the youth worker and had a private discussion about some of the experiences that she had had. Um, so we supported her for about two years and um, uh, also made a referral to social services. Um, she was at the point in her life where she really wanted to address the problems that she was having. Um, she was very suicidal, she was self-harming because of the sexual abuse that she had endured for five years. Um, her home environment was absolutely not safe. Um, and um, so she disclosed fully to the social worker what was happening to her, what had happened to her. And the social worker said to her that, well, what you're saying is so horrendous that I think you've made it up. Um, so she returned to us, uh, to, to um, uh, our organization, and she said this is what the social worker said to her. Um, and so we immediately <laughs> um, um, got uh, uh, started contacting the social worker. This was about two years ago, and it was about the week before Christmas when everything just shuts down. And um, so she wasn't going to get any support. She could not be returned to the home um, because she would face further violence if she was returned home. She was fearful of her life, um, and we couldn't get social services to react in the way that they should be reacting, and they didn't believe. Uh, what she was experiencing. Um, so these are the kinds of cases that, that we have where we are dealing with horrendous forms of abuse, um, where it's gone on for a very, very long time, where women, young women, come to us at stages where they are traumatized, where they are feeling suicidal, where they have been self-harming, um, and they're not getting the kind of response that they should be getting from children's protective and safeguarding agencies. Um, and so in these cases, it requires a lot of advocacy work um, uh, and support work from organizations like ours to ensure that they are getting the support that they need. In this case, what happened um, in December when, when she was told by the social worker that, uh, that she was making it up. Um, she was returned home, she left, um, and uh, we were able to get her into a residence, uh, residential facility that uh, supported young, young people for the Christmas period. Uh, and then uh, after the Christmas period, continued the advocacy work further into a proper care arrangement. Um, today, she um, is recovering from the experiences, she is regaining her education, and she says that she wants to uh, work in a women's organization to support others. So, um, it's a positive outcome now, but the struggle to get to the positive outcome should not have happened in the way that it had happened. She should have been believed, and she should have been supported, and she wasn't. Um, outside of, of uh, as our organization, which is a specialist women's organization. Um, so uh, historical abuse, we've had a number of cases of historical abuse of young women and girls. This is where the abuse happens very early in life. Um, and then the young woman and girl, young, young girl is told to forget about it. Um, so there's an element of community collusion that takes place, or family collusion that takes place. She told, she's told to forget about it, but later in life, of course, um, she remembers the abuse and the trauma from the abuse. Um, and so in these cases, there's usually a lot of self-harming behavior, um, uh, suicidal behavior, and then
then um, she accesses support later in life um, to deal with the trauma from the abuse that happened early in life. Um, we have a specialist project which is called Normalization uh, or Challenging and Addressing Normalization, Acceptance and Tolerance of Abuse. And this program uh, works with young women and girls in schools and colleges to look at the attitudes and the behaviors um, that, um, uh, that normalize abuse and violence. And uh, so that, that project has been running for about three years. Uh, we have counseling therapeutic support services, um, uh, uh, specialist projects to address grooming um, and sexual harassment. I've put up there no go bus stops um, and um, young women who've designated certain bus stops where there's a high level of sexual harassment that takes place, so they won't use those bus stops. Um, and um, and also honor-based violence. Um, so we've got specialist projects which support young women through honor-based violence. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, so in terms of our school's work, um, we've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, sorry, Zoom. <laughs> sorry. We've been doing this for about 20 years, and we offer a number of services in the schools. So we have issues-led workshops, support groups, the advocacy work that we do quite a bit, because if we don't do the advocacy work, then young women and girls don't get the support that they need if they're referred to social services. So they do need that um, support from a, a specialist organization. Otherwise, they're not going to get the services they, they need. Um, we do uh, one to one individual support, uh, counseling therapeutic, and then also a lot of creative work that we're doing. So we've got recently funding coming through to look at how creativity can be used in the process of recovery. Uh, I think that's it. What your book on display as well? Oh, yes. Um, I brought along a book, a um, coffee table book, which has some of the history. The photos in the coffee table book were taken from uh, the refuges. So we had a special project um, involving women in the refuges. Um, and, and you can see that in the coffee table book. Um, in the slide, you've got just a list of the projects and um, initiatives that we're undertaking, yes. Yeah, just a question going back to, um, I'm sorry. I just had a question going back to what you were saying about um, early enforced marriage in the legislation. Um, and obviously, we're often really pushing that law reflects what the practices should be, but as you're saying, that actually discourages people from coming forward. Um, so I wondered if yourself and the project have any ideas about actually what you would prefer to see in that instance to really encourage people to come forward but have it also recognised in the world? Um, I think one of the things that, that we've struggled with over the years, especially when it comes to the forced marriage legislation, is that there's a heavy emphasis on prosecution, um, but not so much on support, early intervention, um, and just the frontline uh, provision that, that um, those who are at risk of suffering forced marriage require. And I think where you have that, um, then it becomes a, a way to prevent young people from coming forward and disclosing forced marriage um, because they know that there's going to be prosecution and everybody knows there's going to be prosecution under forced marriage legislation, um, but they're not sure of the support provision that's available. Um, and I think the UN uh, definition of violence against women and girls recognizes that there has to be a comprehensive approach to addressing violence against women and girls. Yes, it should in involve prosecution, but it shouldn't only emphasize prosecution at the expense of support services. Um, so where you have a much more comprehensive approach, you have much better results, and that's what we're finding. Um, but if it's just prosecution-led, then it's not going to happen. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, so I was wondering, in terms of the work that you do in schools, um, are you working predominantly with girls, or is it an integrated approach where you work with boys to try and, you know, discuss these kind of attitudes that, um, towards women and to try and foster 
you know, sort of a more positive uh, future in terms of how men and women interact with each other? Um, we've got one project which is based around awareness raising workshops um, and in that project we do general awareness raising which involves boys and girls um, and then we have special we have specialist gendered space so that if there are certain issues that girls want to discuss in gender space then they've got that um, access but that's the only project which is around just general awareness raising the book and um, and addressing what a healthy relationship looks like and what an unhealthy relationship looks like and that involves boys and girls with special space for girls to break away and so also just um, i'm interested in um you know talking about the work you do with women and um whether women get like in terms of the percentage of women that feel that they can maybe go to the police and to try and ch press charges against um, the perpetrators of the, the violence against them um, and with that you know you know the success rate or you know how the, the police react whenever people come forward about these kind of uh, abuses okay it's very low um, the number of women who go to police um, it usually, and we've seen this over the years, it happens at crisis point where the woman feels that if she doesn't leave the house now and goes to the police, then her life is in danger. Um, so the rate of women going to the police is, is very, very low. Um, and um, the police actually making referrals to us is very high. <laughs> So, um, so they know that we're out. Obviously, we've been there for 30 years. The local police stations do know that, that we exist. So they do make referrals to us, but the other way around, it is very low. What we're finding is that where we, um, in the process of, of support, where we think that, that police inter intervention might be appropriate, um, if we have that discussion with women and girls, not in the refuge context, but um, in all of our other services, then they do disengage from the service. Um, they don't want to have uh, police intervention um, in, in, um, in their support. The reason why that happens is, is um, that, and they say this to us very clearly, that if they wanted to go to the police, they would go to the police. Um, but they're coming to us because they want support. And that's been a consistent message over 30 years. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of work still to be done with the police. Um, I would say that recently, the way that the police have responded, in, in the localized context, not broadly, but the way that the police have responded to domestic violence, has been much better than the way that social services have responded to domestic violence. But very in the localized context, in our particular experience, I'm not talking broadly, so. Yeah. Any questions online? No. Could you say a bit about, I mean, it's interesting what you've just said about the police, that they're actually referring to the project, is it, is it working? Yeah. Well, um, more now, well, more than the other way of the, than women going to the police directly. Presumably that's because of the work that, that the project has done with the police over the 30 years. Could you say a bit about the work that you have done with the police and, and how and how well that's been received? Um, We've, uh, well, for 30 years, we've uh, worked very closely with the police with regard to refuge services. Um, and uh, so, for example, if um, a woman is accessing the refuge and she needs to return to her home to pick up her belongings, um, then we get police escort. Um, so we don't accept in our refuges referrals from women within the local authority area. So women from Newham are referred outside and women from outside are referred in. Um, so obviously there's a lot of police interaction um, at that stage because the police have to escort the woman and the staff or, or the staff by themselves to pick up the belongings that the woman's left behind. Um, so a relationship really develops between the organizations and the police because of the kind of work that we do um, with uh, the refuge provision. Um, 
the um, a very good example of other types of engagement that we have with the police is um, about a few years ago um, we were invited to a discussion and it was about addressing or raising the concern about domestic violence um, to privatize legal processes. So um, things like Sharia courts, talking to um, uh, those who administer Sharia courts about domestic violence and appropriate responses. And we were called in to uh, have a meeting with the police to see what that kind of engagement should look like, what should be the key messages, and, um, and how uh, we can ensure that women get appropriately supported. We were very concerned about this because um, the privatized legal processes um, in cases of domestic violence um, were, um, yeah, their, their main response was to mediate in cases of domestic violence, which is a very inappropriate response for domestic violence cases, so we wanted to address that that response that they had to cases of domestic violence, which means that they were sending women back to violent relationships for longer. Um, so we had a lot of engagement with the police about why we felt that um, we mustn't accept these types of responses and that we must really frame our response in the context of human rights. Um, and also the fact that in, under British law, there are certain remedies that are available to women, and all women should have access to those remedies. That was positive engagement. Um, uh, so I think uh, just in terms of the of our interaction with the police, um, it's there have been some really good positive examples, and then other examples where um, where women just haven't had the kind of support. Um, that they felt they could have, um, and uh, and then have have preferred not to um, not to have police intervention in their cases. Um, I could mention also the Prevent um, initiative of the police. Um, Prevent is having a very negative impact in the sense that it's almost assuming. Um, uh, radicalization um, based on um, persons' ethnic background. Um, and that's having a devastating impact because um, it's just not something that women are engaging in. So. Great, thanks. Um, any other questions? <coughs> Do you want to ask us anything, Roger? Uh, no, just um, a little bit more information about uh, your violence against women and girls strategy as Save the Children. Um, uh, in perhaps over the next five years, and then also the UN Millennium Goal. I think it's Goal Five, which addresses violence against women and girls and how you sort of link to um, some of the objectives under that that goal. I'm not sure who can speak to that. Sheila was here. She has left. Claudia, can you say a bit? Uh, yes. Thanks. I, yeah, I'll do my best. Um, we are currently, so hi, my name is Claudia. I'm one of our general quality um, officers. Um, we are currently, we've got a new people in the team now working on a new strategy for the next three years, which is really exciting. And the big focus within that is going to be only on kind of more general issues of gender inequalities that affect all our different areas within education, protection, and health, um, but it's more specifically on um, violence against women and girls and child marriage within that. So we're looking at this focus on child early and forced marriage. Um, in terms of the details, I can't really give that much information, but a really big thing that we've identified, and we've been having conversations today about this, is about how we better partner with and how we better work with and empower local organisations and particularly local women's rights organisations. And a big international NGO that can be really, that whole process can be quite convoluted because we know that in different countries we're doing that in different ways. Um, but a real big emphasis for us that people will hopefully see coming up in the next, in the next few months is about actually how we can, you know, 
find and work with those women's rights organisations and really support them to be doing the work. Because again, as we see in the UK, I think we see it across the board in all the countries that we work, that when it comes to tackling issues of violence against women and girls and changing behaviours and changing social norms around that, it's really those local-led organisations that can make the real difference. Um, so I really, yeah, I think that's really great that we're trying to move that focus a bit, yeah. Yeah, well, hi, I'm Jessica, I actually work with Wilson, um, in a different team. And just one more thing to add to that, I think one of the other key focuses that we're hoping to, to work with in the next few years is um, improving the mainstream of gender and poverty across our programmes. So in our education and our health and our livelihood programmes, gender is actually to acknowledge, to acknowledge the different needs of people within our programs, um, to make sure that we're responding to those needs adequately um, is going to be really important. Um, and actually addressing some of the barriers access to those services such as education to make those programs even better. I just have another question actually. Um, so you mentioned the program program, and I've heard it on the news being talked about a lot, um, and pretty much anyone that I've heard speak about it has said that it is really doing damage in these areas as you were speaking about. And I'm I'm interested in actually whether organisations like yourselves, whether there's any kind of movement going on around moulding and changing that programme. Because I hear a lot of people talking about how it's negative, but I haven't heard anything from the government organisations in education as they're talking about actually, okay, we recognise that this is having a negative impact, what are we going to do to change that? Uh, there, there has been a lot of um, activism around prevent uh, from organisations like ours um, and we're at the stages where we're building up the case file evidence of the negative impact that it's having. Um, in terms of uh, government level, no there hasn't been too much about changing the programme. Um, I think that it fits into other policy objectives. Um, so the program from the way that we've experienced it is as it was when, when it was first conceptualized. Um, but we are responding to it um, and hoping to just get rid of it. Um, because it's not really um, it's not really doing the job that it's supposed to be doing. I think one of the critical problems that we've got with it is that it's being linked to domestic violence. So whole, the whole agenda around radicalization and domestic violence um, is, is being linked, and we don't necessarily see that link. So for example, when Prevent was first introduced, I got a call from one of the, the uh, a police officer from a local police station saying that he's working on Prevent, and he wants to know um, um, what the risk is within our organization of radicalization. Um, and so it just didn't, it doesn't make sense the way that they're linking prevent and domestic violence or violence against women and girls initiatives. But if I look at it geopolitically, I can see how the whole violence against women and girls agenda is um, being used for certain geopolitical um, objectives around the world um, and how it's being used in situations of war to justify Sorry, I'm getting political <laughs> to justify invasions, etc. Yeah, yeah, so I think it's it's yeah it's a very contentious um, uh, initiative, and it's not doing anything to promote women's rights and access to human rights frameworks. Thanks very much. I don't know about you. I mean, I thought that was an absolutely fascinating discussion, presentation. You know, so much information to take in. I thought the, the sort of the, the placing of of, of, of um, your work within the wider political framework from you know the early sort of the late 70s, early 80s to the present day, talking about the event. I think it's just a really, really interesting. Thanks very much. And and. Best wishes for Thank you. uh, your campaign against the austerity cuts and cutbacks and, and closures of, of such vital important services to women and children. Um, th thanks also for your your free.
freebie, your gift. Um, people online, if you would like, I mean, we have some spare copies here, so if you would like a copy of uh, the publication from London Black Women's Project, then get in touch with Hannah or me and we'll, we'll get a copy to you. Um, but yeah, please, a huge round of applause.